Dog walks, poo sticks and discarded shopping trolleys. Rivers like this epitomise the typical British countryside. But beneath these crystal clear waters lies a murky truth. When the river level rises, it poses a significant threat to our livelihoods. But where do these problems stem from? Well, hidden beneath these river banks lies a secret assassin. To find out more, we'll have to wait until it's dark. Can you tell us a little bit about these so-called secret assassins? Certainly, these secret assassins are in fact the invasive American signal crayfish. Uh, they're a small freshwater lobster that were introduced to the UK in the 1970s uh, for aquaculture. But since they've escaped their holding pools and they've colonised pretty much every river throughout the UK. Now, in America this isn't a problem because there they don't burrow. But since coming to the UK they just love burrowing into this really soft, muddy bank material. Now, it's suggested that they could borrow for many reasons, for shelter, uh, for storing food in, even to raise their young. But in truth, we really don't know what it is that's causing them to burrow. So these sort of burrows that they make, what kind of impact does this have on these apparently already fragile banks? Well, there are many potential impacts and we're working at the moment to try and see whether uh, lots of burrows into the banks could cause a lack of cohesion in the banks that would result in them collapsing into the river more frequently. Now there have been suggestions in Oxford where a wall collapsed as, uh, from one of the university buildings last year that that was caused by crayfish from them burrowing under the foundations. Okay, well if I was to go to my local river and find one of these crayfish, what sort of advice do you have for someone like me? Well, the chances of you seeing these crayfish are pretty low. That's why I've brought you out at night, because they're nocturnal. During the day, they sit in the burrows that they make. But if you do see them, we recommend that you don't touch them. They're not easy to identify. It's not like lions and tigers. They look very similar to the natives. Now, the Americans have got bigger claws and they've got a small square blue patch on their claws that gives them the signal name. However, even if you're sure, we recommend not to touch because the American signal crayfish carry cray crayfish plague, uh, which is fatal to our native population. And if you were to touch the crayfish plague and then spread it to a different river, that could be fatal for our remaining endangered native crayfish. We apologize for the interruption of this broadcast. We are currently experiencing technical difficulties. It turns out nobody is sure why these crayfish burrow. Though if you were to drop me in a decade full of Noel Edmonds, Spandex and Reliant Robins, I too would want to bury myself head first into a dark, damp hole. I'm interested to find out what possible link there could be between the crayfish and last night's power cut. Landslides have been known to generate turbidity currents, and turbidity currents have been known to be quite powerful. It is absolutely possible that the burrowing of the crayfish along the riverside caused a bank collapse, which generated a turbidity current and broke the underwater cables. If the local council were laying electricity cables across the river, which I'm sure they quite often do, <laughs> the turbidity current which was generated by the landslide may have broken the cables, which led to the power cut. Can you show us what the turbidity current looks like? Well, first I will explain what a turbidity current is and then I will show you what one looks like. A turbidity current is an underwater flow of sand and mud. They tend to be quite turbulent and are driven by their density and flow under gravity. A turbidity current looks a little bit like this. Ugh. Oh God. Okay. So. Da -da -da. In this case, we see the cool, dark liquid flowing beneath the warm upper liquid. This would, of course, be a turbidity current. <laughs> uh. These are obviously quite devastating. So how are we trying to monitor them? You are correct. They can be quite devastating. The fastest turbidity current was recorded traveling at over 45 miles per hour. So the power behind these flows is quite significant. The conventional way to monitor these flows is to put instruments in their path and this, of course, can present something of a problem when the instruments are dragged away by the flow, 
completely destroyed or just lost. So yes, how do we get around this problem? Well, we can go out in a boat, for example, and suspend instruments above the flow that monitors it from above. And this keeps the instrument out of harm's way and saves everyone a lot of money. I thank you very much for your time. You are most welcome, Nick. All this talk about bank collapse is a bit 2008 for me. I want to find out more about what happens to the sediment once it's in the channel. Lots of sediment must reach the channel, but where does it all end up? So when sediment gets into the channel, the lighter particles will flow with the water downstream and the heavier particles will settle out onto the bed. It's when we get the fine sediment covering the coarse sediment that we get the biggest problems. So coarse sediment is a great uh, habitat for spawning sites for salmon and other fish. And we also have a, lot, a very big macroinvertebrate community that live within them. Once the fine sediment deposits on, it smothers the spawning habitats and it also destroys a lot of the habitats for um, the macroinvertebrates. Um, perhaps for the biggest threat for humans is when uh, the fine sediment deposits on top of the coarse sediment and it reduces the amount of uh, space that the water has to move within the channel, increasing flood risk in that area. Surely we can just scoop it all out? So that's a great question and traditionally that's exactly what we used to do. We used to put heavy machinery into the channels and scoop out the fine sediment on the bottom and then we'd maintain this trapezoidal shape. Um, but we since found out that's not very good for the ecological uh, habitats within the channel as it just it destroyed uh, diversity and we just ended up with a monotonous corridor. So now we're trying to find new creative ways to get away from the costly hard engineering techniques and to bring in more natural flood management. So we're trying to stop sediment getting into the channel in the first place by um, adding uh, large buffer strips onto farmers' fields to stop bare earth falling off in the winter and also large river corridors, so great big space between to keep the banks stable and create new habitats. That's all very fascinating, thank you very much. For over 100 years, weirs have been used to reduce flood risk. But weirs are now being removed as a form of river restoration. Hi Millie, do you mind if I interrupt your work? <laughs> Go on then. This weir you're standing on, what effect does it have on the river? So weirs impact the connectivity of the river, so sediment transport, a lot of sediment that would usually just carry on downstream when it's uh, in the floor is, is caught behind the weir, which means that sometimes downstream areas are sediment starved. The weir also interrupts the floor, so where in a river you usually get quite a diverse array of fast flowing and slow flowing water. A weir means that you get a lot of stagnant or slow flowing water, which is quite same here, not really good for the habitat. Uh, it means that sediment that's caught behind the weir smothers where fish would usually spawn their eggs or where microinvertebrates might live. And also it has a direct impact on fish passage. A lot of fish, especially weirs of this size, juvenile, juvenile fish can't actually swim of it. So it means that there's a lack of fish upstream so I guess one solution would be taking the weir away. But if we were to do that, what risks would it pose? So there are risks associated with weir removal, but hopefully these will be short term. So you might see an increase in bank erosion where the bank's usually supported by the high flow, but there can be a dramatic drop in water level following weir removal, which means that the banks are free to actually collapse into the river. Uh, there could also be a slight increase in localised flood risk as well. But we'd hope that the risk will be quite short term and that once the river starts to gain equilibrium again and become more natural, that these risks will really dissipate out. OK, well, I'll let you get back to your work. Thanks for your time. Thank you. As it turns out, river processes are much more complex than I'd ever given credit. Whilst trying to solve old problems, like weirs, we're faced with new challenges, such as the introduction of signal crayfish. With a constantly changing planet, we must find a balance between our impact on nature and how nature affects us. But for now, how about a game of poo sticks? <laughs>